you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Hey, hit that like button if you want to spread some common sense news coverage. And uh, let's just jump into it. This is a news show. And the first thing that we're going to talk about today was easily one of the most requested stories over the weekend on the text line, right? You have the situation with NYU marketing professor Scott Galloway absolutely making headlines right now and sparking debate after telling CNN on Saturday that fewer men going into college will result in a mating crisis. Right? And so to set this up, the Wall Street Journal reported earlier this month that women made up 59.5% of college students at the end of the 2021 school year, which is an all-time high. And adding that if this trend continues in the next few years, we'll see two women earn a degree for every one man. So on that, you had Galloway saying, The most dangerous dangerous person in the world is a broke and a lone male. And we are producing too many of them. The mating inequality that's going to come out of this dearth of men in college poses an existential risk to our economy and our society. The bottom line is we on the left like to think that men and women are exactly the same. They aren't. They're different, including in their mating preferences. And the reality is college graduate women aren't interested in mating with men who don't have college degrees. If you look at the most unstable, violent societies in the world, they all have one thing in common. They have young, depressed men who aren't attaching to work, aren't attaching to school, and aren't attaching to relationships. And our inability to provide the resources and encourage men to go to college is going to result in, in us producing too many of the most dangerous cohort in the world. Kelly also going on to list reasons why he thinks this is happening, saying that among other things, the rising cost of college is driving men away, that college age men have more job options than their female peers. Well, yes, you had a number of people agreeing with him, nodding their heads. You also saw a lot of pushback. People noting that his remarks are very speculative. Others saying that it sounds like he's almost blaming women and painting men as victims in a world where they already have so much opportunity. With others also taking issue for almost kind of the exact opposite reason, saying that he's being unfair to men, kind of labeling them as these villainous monsters that you have to kind of feed or appease, otherwise they destroy the world. All right, so with this story, rather than tainting it with my opinion this time, whoever you are, however you identify, I'd really love to know your thoughts on this. All right, across the board, whether it be his reasoning, the stuff he's saying, the validity or not, yeah, let me know. Then, an absolutely massive breaking news. After decades of accusations, R. Kelly has been convicted on all nine counts of racketeering and sex trafficking that he was facing in a federal trial in New York. Right, federal prosecutors there had accused Kelly of leading a scheme to recruit women and underage girls and boys for sex. With Kelly's sentencing is scheduled for May 2022, and he faces potentially up to life in prison. But understand, in no way does that mean his legal troubles stop here. Like, there's a lot. He still has another federal trial awaiting him in Illinois, where he's accused of child pornography and obstruction of justice. Also facing additional criminal charges in Illinois for aggravated criminal sexual abuse involving four victims, including three minors. Then you jump over to Minnesota where he's charged with engaging in prostitution with a child. So clearly he is not going anywhere. But still, this ruling alone is massive because as one report notes, the verdict represents the first criminal consequence after decades of murmurs and accusations of sexual abuse and other misbehavior. But yeah, main point I guess is let that be a lesson to everyone out there that you can only be a monster for like a decade or three and then maybe, just maybe, bad stuff will happen to you too. Then in entertainment slash entertainer news, we had online entertainment and musician, corpse husband in the news for really one of the two reasons he's always in the news. One, it's because he's trending on social media because new people heard his voice and they were like, spit in my mouth. Hey, no problem, Philip DeFranco on YouTube.com. It happens, but... If you ever mess up a story about me again, I'm slicing off your pinky toe. Praise Bingus. And two, uh, who is he? That's the question. Who is he? What does he look like? Or like a number of other internet creators that have absolutely blown up over the past year or two, he's never shown his face online. Right? And with all of us living in a time where we have this magic little thing in our pocket that allows us to know anything that ever happened or is happening now, people go, why don't I know this thing? And so you just take a look out there. You see it's driven a number of people absolutely loony. Others putting on their internet detective or troll hats, posting pictures uh, that they say are him. With most recently, a few Twitter post gaining a ton of traction. Now, I'm not going to be showing those posts here. And that is for two reasons. One, I don't want to expose the guy. And two, people are being absolutely shitty about the person featured. Which, I mean, if it's just some random person or it actually turns out this is Corpse Husband, still shitty. There are absolutely a ton of people responding with really nasty comments, calling the person in the photos ugly among other things. Which also prompted other Corpse Husband fans to write things like, this alleged face reveal just showed how fucked our world is. You think Corpse is this mega hot guy, then y'all start bullying him when he didn't meet your standards. As well as saying he literally 
he sings about how self-conscious he is about his appearance and you guys are out here bashing him because he didn't live up to your fantasy. Disgusting, absolutely pathetic. Right? And this is nowhere near the first story of its kind. Uh, I think most recently we talked about this situation with Dream. But here's what I'll say. If you're one of the people out there that's writing just disgusting things or nasty things about this person who may or may not be Corpse, seriously, go fuck yourself and or grow up. Or like if Corpse was out here hiding behind his avatar calling other people ugly and then he kind of got like exposed in some way, that would be one thing. Or hell, even if he wasn't hiding behind an avatar, right? He unprompted, he, he was throwing out hate about how people look. I think that then opens the door, invites people in. We've definitely mocked people who have attacked others because of their looks. But the reality of the situation appears, this guy is just a guy trying to live his life and entertain people without having to put his face forward. You know, just letting the content be king. But yeah, that's where I land on. And then let's talk about Instagram, but for kids. Or for a while now, Facebook, which owns Instagram, being very adamant about the need to continue pushing forward with a kid-friendly version of Instagram, right? publicly stressing the positive effects that social media can have on teens and preteens. Also, at the same time, trying to downplay the Wall Street Journal report that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, publishing internal Facebook documents showing just how harmful Instagram can be for teens. With Facebook even fighting back yesterday, claiming that the Wall Street Journal had cherry-picked damning bits of information without also covering the more optimistic data. But as of today, after all of that, the company is now pumping the brakes, saying this morning, while we believe building Instagram kids is the right thing to do, Instagram and its parent company, Facebook, will reevaluate the project at a later date. And adding in the interim, Instagram will continue to focus on teen safety and expanding parental supervision features for teens. But just like a mega company making some sort of settlement with the government, they will not admit wrongdoing. With Instagram head Adam Masseri stressing that this pause isn't the company admitting that Instagram for kids is a bad idea, saying that's not the case. The reality is that kids are already online and we believe that developing age-appropriate experiences designed specifically for them is far better for parents than where we are today. With that, you have Facebook saying that it plans to work with parents, experts, and policymakers to demonstrate the value and need for this product. With this story, I was wondering what you beautiful bastards were thinking. I put up a poll on the community page here on YouTube. Of those polls, almost all locked in. 87% saying they think Instagram for kids is a bad idea. With the number of people arguing that there are predators online, it's like taking all the fish, putting them in one easy to find barrel. Though even some who thought that it was a bad idea saying, you know, I want to see more. You know, maybe there is possibly a world to make a safe space. I don't know. And so especially if you didn't take part in the poll, I'd love to know your thoughts. Are you in the majority here, the minority? Why, why not? Let me know. From that, I want to take a second to thank the fantastic sponsor of today's show, stamps.com slash Phil. You know, whether you're a small office sending out invoices and online seller shipping orders, or even a giant warehouse sending thousands of packages out a day, Stamps.com is great for any size business. Print official U.S. postage from your computer 24-7, no special supplies or equipment needed. And with Stamps.com slash Phil, you get up to 40% off post office rates and up to 66% off UPS rates. And cut the confusion out of shipping with Stamps.com's new Rate Advisor tool. Compare shipping rates and timelines to easily find the best option. Personally, I love how convenient and cost-effective this is for me and my business. I mean, I can get all my mailing and shipping done without even leaving my house. Something that's definitely important is each one of these drops. The next one's actually October 4th. is getting bigger and bigger, both in the number of orders and the number of offerings. Like I need that. Stamps.com saves me time and money, freeing me up to produce the show, work on the new studio, create awesome new designs for the next drop. I say, hey, right now, go to stamps.com slash Phil to get a four week trial, plus free postage and a digital scale. You got no risk, no long-term commitments, no contracts, and never go to the post office again. And remember that is stamps.com slash Phil. Then we should definitely talk about COVID mandates and what's happening in New York right now. All right, so New York State's mandate requiring all healthcare workers to be vaccinated against COVID has officially gone into effect as of today, marking the largest test case for how similar rules will play out across the nation. Under the mandate, the state's roughly 665,000 healthcare workers at hospitals and nursing homes must receive the first dose by today or risk losing their job. And that appears to be a risk that tens of thousands of workers are willing to take. According to the most recent numbers, as of last week, 84% of all hospital employees and 77% of nursing home facility staff were fully vaccinated. Now, notably here, unvaccinated healthcare workers can still apply for a religious exemption until at least October 12th, which is when a federal judge is set to consider a legal challenge to the policy, which right now allows for medical exemptions, but not religious ones. And so if the judge rules in favor of that challenge, there will likely be some major leeway for healthcare workers who don't want to be vaccinated. But still, with this new rule going into effect, state officials, hospitals, and nursing homes all across the state are preparing for major healthcare disruptions and worker shortages. According to reports, some providers are cutting back on elective surgeries, limiting admissions, and retaining volunteers. And with all this, in a press release on Saturday, you had the governor of New York outlining several options to address the expected staff shortages. This including preparing an emergency declaration that would let providers licensed in other states or countries recent graduates and retired healthcare professionals practice in the state. The governor also adding that there are other options, including deploying medically trained National Guard members and working with federal government and other state leaders to explore other ways to expedite visa requests for medical professionals. And to make matters more concerning and complicated, I mean, this is all happening as the U.S. is already experiencing a nationwide shortage of healthcare workers, and there are growing concerns that vaccine mandates could make that worse, especially in rural areas where vaccination rates are already low and employees are hard to find. Well, right now, it is unclear exactly how severe 
the staffing shortages in New York will be. Experts have said that the state will set an important precedent on how similar mandates are enforced nationwide. Right, so far, only Rhode Island, Maine, Oregon, and Washington, D.C. have imposed vaccine mandates for healthcare workers, though none of those policies are being enforced yet. Meanwhile, in places like California, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Illinois, they have policies that set up the option to get tested regularly if you don't get the shot. But as the New York Times notes, resistance to vaccine mandates has so far stopped most states from threatening to fire unvaccinated workers, despite the fact that employers are legally allowed to require workers to get vaccinated, according to the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And so that's why all eyes are on New York to see what essentially happens from this test and could it provide a blueprint? Yeah, that's where we are today is essentially day zero. We'll have to keep our eyes on it. And of course, with us, I'd love to know your thoughts. And then we should definitely talk about this massive news out of Germany, huge news for the country, the EU, maybe even the world. And that's because on Sunday, Germany held federal elections, what many people believe are the most important elections in over a decade. And that is because Chancellor Angela Merkel, who has been in the position since 2005, decided that she was not going to run for office again. Right, for 16 years, her coalition of two center-right parties, known as the Union Parties, have held on to pluralities in the legislature. With many of her supporters describing that time as a golden era, although others say that only happened because of the SPD's involvement. But either way, we saw gay marriage legalized, the minimum wage raised, the economy absolutely busted. What? Bussin'. Y'all, we talked about this in the meeting. You can't just randomly insert Gen Z slang and things that's gonna give us younger viewers. You can't do that. And that's not who we are. What can a factor cap? Anyway, on Sunday, what we ended up seeing was the center-left Social Democratic Party managing to make the most of this opportunity. According to the preliminary results, it looks like the SPD have won 25.7% of the legislature seats, making it the largest party in parliament. While it may not seem like a lot to us Americans, right, we're in the, the two-party mindset, Germany has eight parties represented in the legislature. And so with the voting in this election, there are two big things. Right. The SPD did much better last time. They only got about over 20% of the vote. But also, because they don't have a clear majority, the SPD will now need to approach other parties to try and make a government. Olaf Scholz, the SPD's leader and possibly the next chancellor, sounding hopeful in a victory speech that the likely allies will be the Green Party and the FDP. And those preliminary talks, according to German media, seem to indicate that the plan is moving along nicely. But there is a chance that the union parties could still manage to sneak in an alliance with those parties instead. And that is because most of these parties all adhere to relatively moderate politics and have a history of working together. As a matter of fact, the SPD SPD and union parties have been working together for almost the last four years, which may happen again if negotiations fail. Actually, on that note, this election is notable because many are calling it a win for moderate politics. The parties that are likely to form a government here are either center left or center right. You know, that is a very big deal because extremist politics have been on the rise, especially in Europe. And going into this, there were concerns that parties like Germany's far right AFD would see big wins, but they ended up actually losing seats over the weekend. But all of this news is just the first step. I mean, as far as what happens next, it's gonna take weeks or even months for a government to form. If Angela Merkel's staying in office until then. So for now, this is gonna be something we keep our eyes on, but really we just have to wait and see how everything lands. Then, sticking with international news, we should definitely talk about the United Kingdom facing a real problem right now, or a massive shortage of gas or petrol for the Brits that are watching. And the issue, as it turns out, is very simple. There just weren't enough truck drivers, which actually isn't unsurprising because many drivers were foreigners working in the UK. But after that little thing called Brexit, they had to go, and now the country is short by like 100,000 truck drivers. However, of note, most gas stations were actually still getting enough fuel for their community. But and this is an issue that comes with reporting. Once the news got out, that a few gas stations had closed, that led to a massive amount of panic buying throughout the UK over the weekend. Most gas stations around the UK having lines that made them look like a Costco gas station on a Saturday. By Sunday, many stations simply out of gas. BP saying that about 30% of its 1,200 sites were out. The Federal Retailers Association, which represents about 5,000 independent gas stations, said that about two thirds of its members, they already sold their fuel with the rest partly dry and running out soon. With Brian Madison, chairman of the association, wanting to calm fears about there actually being a gas shortage, saying, there is plenty of fuel in this country, but it is in the wrong place the motorists. It is still in the terminals and the refineries. And saying that he wanted to make it clear that the problem wasn't just a lack of truckers, but rather the result of panic buying pure and simple. But critics have pushed back here saying this doesn't mean that the lack of truckers is not an issue. And saying that it's more of like a situation where they build off, right? If they had enough truckers, they could probably continue to get fuel to the station. And actually, after a ton of internal debate, the UK has decided to bring in foreign truckers, but it's only going to be around 10,000 temporary visas with the president of the British Chamber of Commerce responding that it was like throwing a thimble of water on a bonfire. And adding, without further action, we now face the very real prospect of serious damage to our economic recovery, stifled growth, as well as another less than happy Christmas for many businesses and their customers across the country, which may be why the government reportedly said that it is considering mobilizing the military
military to deliver fuel. With all that said, we're gonna have to wait to see how this plays out, right? If the UK can get the situation under control or if people keep rushing gas stations. And a big money slash crypto news, we should talk about how earlier today, the cryptocurrency exchange platform Binance told users in Singapore that starting late next month, they'll no longer be able to buy and sell crypto on its main platform. Notably, that coming as the country earlier this month clamped down on crypto trading, telling Binance that it could be breaching local law by allowing trades. But it's also not just Singapore. Binance said over the weekend that it's no longer accepting registrations from Chinese mobile numbers. And that's because on Friday, China's central bank made a major announcement telling the country that all cryptocurrency related transactions are illegal. With that, claiming that crypto seriously endangers the safety of people's assets. Right, while China officially banned crypto trading through its domestic exchanges back in 2019, saying that this was a way to suppress money laundering. Since then, they've also been working to restrict people in the country from continuing to trade using online foreign exchanges. And so really, that is exactly what this new decree does. On top of that, anyone in China who participates in crypto related activities will be prosecuted. The country also now gradually phasing out crypto mining operations, and from this point forward, it will no longer allow new operations to pop up, which is pretty significant given that in April of this year, China alone accounted for 46% of the world's Bitcoin energy use. And keep in mind that had already fallen from 76% in September of 2019 because of clampdowns. And so because of all this, we saw major digital currencies like Bitcoin and Ether tumbling. Oh, they've since pretty much rebounded given that most analysts already expected China would do something like this eventually. But still, within China, crypto holders in the country are worried that their investments will now be frozen forever. With one Toronto-based attorney who works in the international crypto trading sphere telling CNBC, I've already received over a dozen messages from Chinese crypto holders looking for solutions on how to access and protect their crypto holdings in foreign exchanges and cold wallets. And adding that along with not being able to do anything with an extremely volatile asset, my suspicion is that the Chinese government will offer them in the future to convert it to EUN at a fixed market price. Right, because China right now is testing a digital version of its currency. And hey, because I never miss the opportunity now, if you're thinking about getting into crypto or maybe you just want $42 for free, head on over to or just click the link down below for Coinbase to Franco.com just for signing up for free. You get $10 in Bitcoin. And then a lot of people overlook this, but they have a reward system where you take a few minutes to learn about crypto and you can get like $32 more in crypto. It's a great service. I use them. I love them. Obviously they're an affiliate, so I benefit and I'm biased. But also the DeFranco hookup is essentially 120 McNuggets worth of crypto. Enjoy or don't. You're a grown ass person. And ultimately that is where that story and actually today's show ends. And hey, join the conversation, whether it be this last story or really anything that stood out to you today. I'd love to know your thoughts in those comments down below. But no matter what you do, of course, my name is Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.